Welcome to Sabbath School today. We want to seek God's guidance as we turn to him in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we ask that you will send your Holy Spirit, teach us the truth that we find in Romans. In the Savior's name we pray. Amen. Welcome to Sabbath School today. This lesson number nine is entitled, No Condemnation. And that comes from Romans chapter 9 and verse 1. It's where we read, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Certainly no condemnation means release from what the fallen Adam left, left to us, which is our inner sense of a verdict of divine judgment which has hung over us all of our lives. There is a sense of bondage and slavery to the bad, which every human, which in many cases is glorified and exonerated. If you can't beat it, then join it and revel in it. Bad boys and bad girls are depicted in all of their raw behavior, but there is a universal cosmic law written in the conscience which cannot be completely scrubbed. When in more sober moments one deals with the conscience, they sense a deep inner self-condemnation. But freedom from that condemnation, what a blessed thing that would be. Romans 8, 2 reads, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Although these feelings of psychic wrong and maladjustment were deep and penetrating, the law of the spirit of life has gone even deeper and is therefore more, far more reaching. The new principle delivers from the craven sense of fear. Guilt and moral disorder have enslaved us even from infancy. No psychiatrist can accomplish such a healing of the human soul. It heals the spirit. Wrongs and the anxieties that even our parents are helpless to relieve find inner cleansing. David speaks of this process this way. When my father and my mother forsake me, that is, where they must leave off, then the Lord will take me up. Then we read this in Romans 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh. We ask, what does the likeness of sinful flesh mean? Does it mean that Christ was born a sinner? The answer to that, of course, is no. Does it mean that really God sent his son in flesh unlike ours? There are some theologians uh, who have, would tell us that it means that just that, but the answer is no. The word likeness in the original does not mean mere resemblance or similar to. It really and truly means like to the point of, of identity. You see, Christ so closely identified himself with us fallen humanity in taking the likeness of our sinful flesh that he was born, now get this, he was born self-centered, but he totally denied self. And this glorious victory was won because God is love. And Christ was God. So Christ was love in fallen sinful flesh, tempted like as we are in all points. The text is 100% true. So that all of his life from his childhood to the hill called Calvary, the Son of God continually denied self. Of course, he was different than we are because from our childhood on, all of us have indulged self. And we have formed terrible years-long habits of indulging self, even to the point of sinful addictions. How in the world then can Christ help such sinners, someone asks. The answer was given. The moment we choose to believe in Christ, which includes appreciating what his he accomplished on his cross and by his life and high priestly ministry. We become partakers of the divine nature so that we can overcome even as he overcame. 
2 Peter 1 verse 4 and Revelation 3.20. Some have said no to that, but I believe it with all of my heart. It is precious good news. Jesus said, I seek not mine own will, that is, self-centeredness. In John 5.30, he said that. Also, John 6, verse 38. And in Gethsemane, the garden, he prayed this, completely denying self, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now we can kneel down beside him, and we can learn from him, and say no to self, and yes to Christ. Now this word flesh, in the original, uh, is the same fallen sinful flesh that all human beings have. And the point is, he took upon himself a self, as we have, we each have a self, and he denied that self. In other words, he took upon himself a will of his own that was in conflict with his father's will, but he totally denied his own will all the way to the cross whereon he was crucified. So Jesus came in that likeness of sinful flesh and condemned sin in the flesh, as our text reads in Romans 8, verse 3. And what is the blessed fruit of that accomplishment? In Romans 8, verse 4, it says, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now that's an inter interesting word, righteousness. It's dikaioma in the original. Now the usual word for righteousness is dikaiosune, which in the New Testament always means the righteousness of God, of Christ, imputed to the sinner. But dikaioma is different. It's actual righteousness of the believer, which is imparted, not merely imputed. Now here's an illustration of that. The lady wears a leopard skin coat. It's imputed. It's not hers. The leopard wears the same coat. It's imparted, a part of him. Now the reason why the long-awaited marriage or wedding of the Lamb has not yet taken place is that his bride hasn't gotten ready. But he's ready, but she's not. But Revelation 19 verse 8 tells how at last the church will not only have imputed righteousness, but will have dikaioma. Here it is. To her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. No, 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 they won't save themselves and they won't have any merit, but their dikaioma will at last honor their Savior and will give him glory. Do you want to get ready for Jesus to come? Amen. We all say amen to that. Then we receive the dikaioma, the righteousness, the imparted righteousness of saints. We go on reading in Romans 8, verse 5, where it says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. My mother used to ask me, What were you thinking when I did something stupid without looking at the long-term consequences of it? For example, when I used my teeth to chew off a cap from a bottle, the enamel of my teeth would chip. Well, if the mind is allowed to go in its natural course, it will revert to the default track of pleasing self, which is the flesh. But the mind that is captivated by the things of the Spirit will be constantly reminded of the cross of Christ. In Romans 8, verse 6, it says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is is life and peace. Now a popular news magazine has come up with an article ridiculing the apologies that governments and churches are making for the sins of their long dead ancestors, such as the Baptist Church, apologizing for supporting slavery 150 years ago. The article reads, without some form of reparations, apologizing for historical wrong is an empty gesture. Very true indeed. 
But what about the human race apologizing for the crucifixion of the Son of God? Wouldn't that be a good thing? The human race shares the guilt. For Romans 3.19 says, All the world is guilty before God. The reason is explained clearly in Romans 8.7 where we read that the carnal mind is enmity against God. And 1 John 3.15 says clearly that enmity is fundamentally murder. That simple Bible study spells out the stark reality that we all share in the murder of the Son of God. We can't argue our way out of it by saying we weren't born 2,000 years ago when it happened. But in a corporate sense, as members of the human race, we were there. If Christ were to come into our modern world as he came into that ancient world and demonstrate the same holy righteousness in his interactions with us in all our modern complex issues of life, we would act as did those people 2,000 years ago because we have by nature the same carnal hearts that they had. No difference says Romans 3.22. And that is, of course, unless in the meantime we should be thoroughly converted and repentant. Now for our question again, how do we apologize to God? To apologize means nothing without reparations, said the news magazine. It's no good telling God, hey, we're sorry we murdered your son. What can we do as repentance? I know of only one answer. Recognize that Christ is, is represented in every person we come in contact with. And now let us treat that person right. Treat him or her as though we were treating Christ, saying I'm sorry, in the way we treat him. The Apostle John says the same thing when he writes, If you want to say, I love you, God, get busy and prove it by loving your fellow men. 1 John 4 Verses 20 and 21. In Romans 8, verse 7, it says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Why is it that we often lose self-respect and common sense in a craven slavery to self-destructive habits? The Bible gives us several insights. Sin is ingrained within us. So addictions follow naturally. Whosoever committeth sin is the slave of sin or servant, John 8, 34. It was an enslaving element. It has an enslaving element built into it. The particular outward form it takes varies with us as individuals. Its root is not chemical but spiritual. Before the chemical form takes place, there is deep heart alienation from God. To be carnally minded is death, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Thirdly, that enmity at last flares up in the murder of the Son of God. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, reads 1 John 3.15. Peter on the day of Pentecost said this in Acts 3.14, Ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted to you, and killed the prince of life. Ye slew and hanged him on a tree. Those who crucified him were acting as our representatives, our surrogates. The enmity against God's law, which is natural to all our human hearts, is the same as motivated those who killed him. Just give it time to blossom, an opportunity and it will flare forth in the same sin. And so in the final judgment, the lost will be arraigned before the tribunal of the universe on the charge of murdering his son. What drove the scribes and the Pharisees and the Romans too to murder Jesus? It was addiction to self. But wait, the cure is identify with Jesus as through sweating blood, he, as though through he, he was sweating blood, he chooses to say no to self, to his will in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Paul reminds us that the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. 
We don't like that word, carnal mind, but we all have it by nature. We inherited it from our father, Adam. It is our nature to be at enmity with God, and therefore at enmity with the Lord Jesus. But thank God we can be converted, and we can receive a new mind. For Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Paul would never say, let this or that be, unless it were possible for it to be. And this new mind is, to, is not something we have to work for or attain to, for Paul says, let it be. Don't stop the Holy Spirit from giving you this new mind. Shall we pray, dear Father in heaven, we thank you again that in Christ Jesus there is no condemnation. We are delivered from the tensions that exist in our mind as a result of being at odds with you and your law. But in Christ Jesus, we have that peace. Let us believe his promise of salvation. In the Savior's name we ask. Amen.